All right, good night or good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thanks for joining. Tonight we have Melanie Crawford with us. Um, recognized corporately as a highly skilled facilitator and curriculum developer, Melanie effortlessly presents concept and information in a system captivating and impactful way. Melanie delivers a wealth of insight and expertise as a corporate soft skills facilitator and keynote speaker. A master of communications, Melanie recently ignited the next level of her dream by transitioning from soft skills facilitation back into her roots of comedy. In 1996, after surviving a traumatic brain injury in a highway accident, it was the stage where Melanie first felt a sense of hope. It was only on the stage where she felt at home. After five years of intensive cognitive rehabilitation and over a decade of establishing a new successful life, Melanie returns to the stage. Branding herself as a motivational comedy specialist, Melanie brings her wealth of personal development, knowledge to the stage and delivers an alarmingly consistent message at a whole new level of transparency. So welcome, Melanie. Thank you for being here with us. Well, thank you. I, Melanie sounds awesome. Like, that was, wow. <laughs> it's so awkward sometimes for me to listen to the intro while the camera's on and I'm getting used to, um, you know, I'm getting used to it, but at the same time, it's still just a little bit awkward. So thank you for doing such a beautiful job. Uh, which you did. And my name is Melanie Crawford. I may or may not have um, uh, spoken or addressed some of you before. I honestly wouldn't remember <laughs> being somebody that has survived a frontal lobe brain injury. I definitely have some memory issues. Um, and that's kind of okay with me because um, as you'll sort of hear me speak about throughout throughout the next, you know, 40, 45 minutes or so, um, I have definitely learned to take my mess and turn it into my message, which I'm happy to share with you tonight. And uh, part of that mess is having memory issues. So it keeps me honest because <laughs> unless I tell anything about the truth, I won't remember what I said. So there you go. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself before I present to you something here. And I don't want you to worry about trying to see these notes because I'm going to provide these to you uh, via email and through Lex um, who can distribute as needed. Um, so you'll have these notes and I do also encourage you to take your own tonight, particularly if you wanted to have some discussion or, um, you know, present a question or a thought. Um, or contribute in any way at the end of our chat. So if at any point I say something that kind of rings your bell, I just encourage you to write it down and bring it up um, once the recording is finished. And I look forward to chatting with, with anybody that's interested at that point. Um, so like I said, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself and how I got to be the person that's delivering um, this uh, interaction with you tonight. I am a 45 year old mother of four memory issues and um, when I was 19 I was hit by a drunk driver and I suffered a frontal lobe brain injury I broke both my arms I actually broke my left hand completely off my arm um, and sadly my my other physical injuries kind of distracted the medical profession from recognizing that I had a closed head injury and it wasn't until I spent um, almost a year exhibiting ridiculously uncharacteristic behaviors um, before somebody said like you sh you know you need to see somebody and sure enough you know I had sustained a very traumatic frontal lobe injury and you may or may not know what the um, uh, um, the uh, prognosis is like uh, frontal lobe is where you have executive functioning critical thinking skills it's your personality center um, decision making, all those, you know, like pretty important things are hosted in your frontal lobe. And mine was just like scrambled eggs. So I had a lot to work with. And, you know, over the course of uh, cognitive rehabilitation, I was able to become something they said I would never be again. So they, they did tell me that I was not a socially appropriate human being. 
I was um, untrainable, unemployable, that I was not uh, equipped to raise my own family. And basically they just kind of, you know, the medical profession just kind of wrote me off. I, I just, you know, the mental illness diagnoses that came with the frontal lobe injury diagnosis was just like profoundly life altering. So through five years of cognitive rehabilitation, I was taught to, you know, behave in ways that are socially acceptable. So essentially what I'm telling you is over the course of five years, while being taught how to use my brain again, because I lost my, you know, natural ability to uh, think, I, I suppose you could say, they taught me the appropriate uh, choices and behaviors and, and thought processes that lead to the right kind of behaviors in order to get along in society at a very basic level, I, I would add. But basically, they taught me how to build a socially acceptable personality. So if I have the recipe for building a personality, why can't I maybe just spice it up a little bit and build other ones, right? You know, do I have a personality disorder or am I really good at my rehab? <laughs> Technically, it's a disorder, but that's okay. Again, I will turn my mess into my message. So over the years of applying what I learned in cognitive rehabilitation, it, I designed and developed um, a curriculum for everything I might you know, run into as a stumbling block in my life as a woman who was told she was never going to be able to raise her own family and yet has four amazing successful children. And as a woman that was told she would never work again. So I became a serial entrepreneur and have been, you know, very successful in, like I said, turning my mess into my message. And I'm, I'm here to share that framework with you that curriculum I developed, you know, the culmination of those years of, of rehabilitation and learning to live with a diagnosis of, you know, personality disorders and, and frontal lobe uh, brain trauma and just overcoming the odds and becoming the relentless individual that I am today. Now, I don't know about you, but I find that uh, focusing, it can be very difficult for me. I don't think we have to even have the same diagnosis. I don't even think we all have to have a brain injury. I don't think it has to be any particular thing that causes us to lose focus, but I think we can all agree that when you can't focus, it really has a, a devastating impact on your life. Um, you know, day to day, hour to hour, literally for me, sometimes minute to minute, it just, it can make my world crumble when I can't gain my focus. Now, I know that there's a million and one, you know, books on um, ADHD or ADD, or there's tips and tricks on, you know, how to stay focused. Um, those are all fantastic, all of them. I, 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 I support and endorse them all. And what I'm here to say is that what I had to learn was how to find my framework, like how to literally um, create a fence around what's whatever's going on in my world and in my mind where it didn't matter where I bounced around within that framework but there was there was a solution there there was always something that could be applied it didn't matter what happened as long as I got inside my framework and that's why I developed this curriculum called focus framework because there was there was no scenario that I wasn't able to solve if I could get myself into this you know, we'll call it a corral or, you know, think of a wild horse that you, you finally rope in and you put him in that fenced area. You know, there's a lot of analogies um, because once you're in there, you can start applying things, but it, until you're in there, you're just that wild horse who, who has immense, you know, guilt or feels pressure or just struggles with self um, esteem and with dignity and, and stuff because you just you, you know it's a constant battle to be productive in your life for one reason or another and lord can we ever focus on the wrong things though can't we regardless we're, we're, that's an, another talk for another day i gotta keep my eye on the time um 
So the framework is the thing that, uh, you know, we, we can use all of those uh, things that we learn on how to, you know, get, get focused and those little uh, tools here and there. We want to use that to get us into the framework. And the framework is something we're going to use whenever we're triggered. And this is the first thing you have to understand is to recognize that as soon as you've been triggered, whatever that looks like for you, it's time to put yourself in, in the framework. Put yourself in the area where the equations will add up. When they taught me how to um, be a socially appropriate person, again, after my injury, um, it was all using thought processes, which are technically algorithms. And because of my injury, I do have the capacity to be a very logical person, which is what an algorithm technically is. But the beauty of being able to apply something that is that logical is that it's finite. And what that means is it's guaranteed to work. So over like over a decade of applying everything I learned and hit and miss and, and trying everything there is to try, I've found my personal, you know, framework for as long as I'm in it, anything I think is fixable, anything. And I'm going to give that to you as well. We, we all know what a trigger is. I'm, I'm going to just assume you're all nodding yes, okay? But just so you can relate to me and just so you can understand that I am speaking, you know, directly to you regardless of what, when or why you might struggle with focus or being productive or just feeling good in general. Um, being triggered means that you're feeling challenged, frustrated, confronted, defensive, or you're feeling like you're lacking control in some way, anyway. I can literally feel like I'm lacking control as soon as somebody asks me a question that I can't decide the answer on. Like, you know, I, that, that can be a trigger for me personally, based on the nature of who I am and what my particular eccentricities are. Um, the other time that we're generally triggered as humans, this is pretty applicable across the board, is when we're experiencing something new or anything that's out of our comfort zone. I mean, that's, that's a trigger pretty much for all of us. Our comfort zone is where it's comfy. So uh, keep that in mind. You, you don't have to wait for things to blow up. This is something that you can apply. As soon as you know you're going to try and do something out of your comfort zone, set yourself up for success and work within your focus framework. You will learn throughout this uh, night as well. I love the F words. So far, we have focus and framework. <laughs> There are other F words, but I have signed, uh, uh, you know, some, some legal documents promising not to use them anymore. That was a joke. <laughs> oh, goodness. Uh, back to focusing, Melanie. Any, any time you recognize that you are about to become unproductive or when you're feeling emotionally charged in not the positive ways. I mean, like adrenaline, we all know what it feels like, but you know that emotional charge you start to feel when you're not entirely happy with the situation? Those are signs for you. Those are signs for you to go, whoa, this is the beginning of a trigger. It's time to get in the framework. So do you see what I'm doing here is I'm trying to equip you to understand when it's time to jump into your arena of guaranteed success. Oh, sorry, I'll try not to punch the table anymore emotionally charged in a positive way now due to time restrictions i can't really elaborate further but i will show you that the notes that i'm going to provide um have a lot of a lot more detail to to sort of help you you know understand and furthermore i will be available via email to, to elaborate or answer questions on these notes once they're sent out of course obviously uh so that's how you know when to put yourself in the framework, okay? Now, remember I was talking to you before about all the other people that have come before me and they've de developed all these different ways to help you regain your focus and different techniques. Like, and I'm not here to shoot any of those down. I'm here to tell you that anything you've ever learned before about how to gain focus or stay focused or get focused, this is when you apply it. When you recognize that you've been triggered or you're facing a new situation, or you're out of your comfort zone, or you're emotionally charged, that's when you take those steps or those toolkits and you use them to put yourself in the arena of success. Nothing has to be solved immediately. Nothing has to be solved at the trigger point. Like does anything ever, you know, happen immediately? Like 
it, it doesn't, except, well, unless you're me and we're talking about a mood swing, but again, another talk for another day. But you want to use every resource you have to simply shift yourself into the place where you know that whatever you think next can be pivoted into success. Like that alone should excite you. I don't mind saying so, because like if I told you that I could physically put you into a place where you could not fail, you'd probably want to go. But I'm just, I'm saying mentally, mentally, this is your arena of success and I want to help you build it. So time check. Time check with glasses on, okay. What we have next is, I'm just going to adjust my notes over here. Okay. What we have next, uh, and I'm just gonna flash these so you can be excited about the colorful notes that are coming your way, is uh, a four-step series that is your arena, right? And these, steps are something that will take a little bit of time to learn in the beginning but once you learn them uh, and you start applying them and you start you start becoming somebody that's in control of your cri crisis moments because we can never get rid of those we can only manage them and so this arena of success that i'm talking about for you personally the focus framework which is what i have uh, called it is where you're going to learn so many new techniques that eventually see for me for someone that's been doing this for years i can jump in at any spot on this so remember i said to you once you're triggered and you want to put yourself into a space mentally where no matter what your next thought is it can be addressed effectively through an algorithmic process like a recipe right now think about this imagine if you had a specialized machine in your kitchen and that machine knew and that let's and i'm gonna uh, step back for a second. That machine is the focus framework in this analogy. Now, it, this machine is in your kitchen and it, it's there to help you not screw up. That's its job. It's there to help you not mess up any recipes because it knows sometimes you get confused. So that machine takes all of the ingredients of your recipe and it basically assesses what you've added to make sure it's matching the recipe. Imagine, wouldn't that machine be wonderful? Just like a second checker, like a quality control machine, you know, and let's say that you have a recipe that does not call for eggs, but you accidentally put eggs in it. And that machine said, alert, alert, these eggs will not work. This, nope, nope, doesn't work. Get it out. And you never have a bad recipe. Doesn't mean you don't accidentally put the wrong stuff in. It just means you're in the arena of success and that machine is your arena of success. It won't allow you to have the wrong outcome. Man, that feels safe, guys. That feels safe. And when you get to build that space in your own mental world, let me see anybody try to stop you. So the process of learning this, and, and when I say this, I'm not... I, uh, I'm not joking, but this literally is a, uh, a course that I can deliver over a one week process. And when I say one week, I'm talking about, you know, a Monday to Friday, nine until four workshop scenario where people walk out with um, changed circumstances. And we're not going to be able to accomplish that tonight. But that does not mean that you are not going to have the tools to get there and the access to answer, ask any questions you need. When you first put yourself into the arena, you need to stop and ask yourself these two questions. The most important questions that you will ever, ever ask yourself, and you'll be asking yourself a lot. I got these questions from Neuro Linguistic Programming Training, which is uh, 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 which was part of my cognitive rehabilitation. And uh, sometimes, like I said, I always give credit where credit's due. And sometimes I, I hear something that I, I know works, but I need to tweak it. And so I just took these two questions out of a neuro-linguistic programming um, curriculum and plugged them into this one in a way that makes a lot more sense to me. And that's what I'm sharing with you. And those two questions are, 
what do I want? Number one, what do I want? First thing to ask yourself, okay? And the second question is, how will I know when I've got it? So, you know, any, remember, when do we put ourselves in the arena of success or the focus framework? When do we do that? And it's when, sorry, sorry for the adjustment here, I'm getting excited and I would normally be pacing, but um, the reason we have to be in this arena of success or the focus framework is because we've been triggered. And I don't know about you, but usually when I'm triggered, I'm thinking about what triggered me. And I mean, like, like I'm thinking about it hard and with probably not the best emotions, like triggers don't generally feel good. Um, they have a lot of negative emotions associated with them usually. And so it's very easy to start thinking down the wrong path as soon as you're triggered because the emotions are charged. You're, you, you're thinking about what you're feeling, aren't you? I do. Oh, Melanie, it just looks like we've lost your sound there for a second. You think about something different. Now, I don't, I don't know about you, but that initial step of thinking about something different already is a step in the right direction. Because even if you're angry or whatever you might be feeling because of your trigger, even if it's righteous and warranted, um, it's not healthy or helpful and it won't give you productivity, which is what you need and what you want and what we all want in that, in that case. Now, when, when, when you are fired up, if you're anything like me and you ask yourself what you want, um, chances are the honest truth about what you want is some sort of vindication. Uh, and and vindication doesn't mean you're, you're having an altercation or, or, or vindication doesn't mean you actually, it doesn't even have to be about a person. It just has to be about a, a situation. Like if you're triggered and you're in a bad place emotionally, generally, you know, we want someone else or something else to also feel bad. And that's what I mean by that vindication uh, aspect. And a lot of us are going to be too ashamed to admit that. And that's why I can spend an entire week with a group on this curriculum, because that's such an important piece to get over is to understand that that first question is going to take you several times to get down to the answer that will allow you to move forward. But the beauty of the focus framework is that every time you, you answer the question, what do I want? Right. And then let's say you answer honestly and you say, Oh, let, you know, let's say, just give it a very simple scenario. Sally and Johnny are playing and Sally broke Johnny's toy. And now Johnny is mad and he's triggered. And Johnny says, what do I want? And initially Johnny's gonna say, I wanna break Sally's toy. Makes sense, right? I mean, we're simplifying this for, for the purposes of this, this talk, but it makes sense. Let's say you have a fender bender. In the heat of the moment when you're triggered, and somebody just rear-ended you, and, and I say to you, stop, let's go into your, uh, uh, where, uh, uh, hang on, <laughs> let's go into your arena of success, or your focus framework, and let me ask you, what do you want, and you're going to say, I want to crash that person's car, or I want them to pay, or I, you know, these are normal, natural, valid, perfectly valid things to want, and the beauty of the focus framework is that once you've identified that that's what you want, there are other things to ask yourself and it will help you filter it out. This is the machine. This is the recipe machine that says, no, that doesn't work for this recipe. Nope, that doesn't work for this recipe. And, and, and that's the beauty of it because there's a series of questions you're gonna ask after that or there's a series of criteria is what I mean to say. Before you can, under, before you can be guaranteed that what you want is possible that what you want is possible and it's basically um again the criteria is a series of checkpoints 
Now, I want you to understand, you're, even if you're thinking this is overwhelming or this is too much to think about, I mean, I want you to understand that already we have successfully taken the focus off of the trigger and we've put it on the solution. Already, never lose sight of that. Even if you need to make a 180 degree change in your life, one degree at a time is how you get there. And when you're feeling triggered and you start thinking about what you want and whether or not it's possible and what it will look like when you have it, you're already succeeding, already. And that's why the second part of that question is so important, guys. If you ask yourself, what do I want? And let's put, let's say you're Johnny again. And you say, I want to break Sally's toy. And then I say, as your brain coach, I say, okay, Johnny, that's a valid thing to want. What will that look like when you've got it? And now Johnny has to say, well, it will look like this toy is broken and Sally will be sad and mad. And all of a sudden they, they have to, you know, um, Uh, shift their personal perspective into a reality of what would it be like if they got what they wanted. And I would like to point out once again, note where your focus is. Again, you're working on a solution. You're not focusing on the trigger. So, you know, eventually people will really quickly understand what the filtering and the criteria process is for answering that question about what do I want? Because the key is it needs to be a real valid, tangible solution, not an emotionally charged feeling. Because when you are able to get your brain onto a track that is thinking about what's actually possible versus what you righteously or, or emotionally need or want, you're back in control. And it doesn't mean you don't get to feel those things or that you're not valid for feeling them. It just means you feel them separately from when you're making your actions and your choices on how to handle the situation. Okay, quick sip. <laughs> so, What do I want and how do I know when I've got it are the two questions. And just to wrap that particular point up, that's the first of four. Um, here's my notes on how to refine that so that you can move from being the person that wants immediate vindication to being the person that wants and knows how to resolve the issue in a way that's gonna make you feel good. So the things to remember, when you say what it is you want, you need to remember it has to be something that's in your control. It has to be something, if I want something, it has to be in my control. And that doesn't mean the first time that I answer the question that I'm gonna be right, but as I refine it down, uh, I will, you and I and everybody that applies this will learn uh, that nothing we want that has something to do with somebody else's behavior will ever come true for us. It's only about what we are in control of. Uh, when you uh, learn that answering the question about what do I want is not a place to blame or, or wish other people will change, you will also speed this process up, but that's going to be a learning curve. You need to be exact, specific, accurate, certain, and realistic when you ask yourself, what do I want? Again, you will get there. It will not happen the first five, 50 times even, but it will come eventually recognize that by asking yourself, what do I want and how will I know when I've got it? You have created focus and you are creating a value in, in the idea of solving the problem. Um, you also want to make sure that in this scenario, once you've, once you've gotten the emotional charge or the trigger, you know, that, that raw trigger under control, you want to start uh, watching your language and looking to phrase things in a positive, in a positive way. For, for an example, um, the process might look something like, you know, Johnny, what do you want? And Johnny says, I want to break Sally's toy. And then Johnny works through that and realizes that's not something that's in his control or something that's going to actually make him feel good. Um, or, or maybe it is, regardless, we're going to we're going to circle back from from that. Um, and then from there, Johnny might say, I want Sally to be sad like I am. And it just will, it'll deescalate basically. 
And then if Johnny might say, I want Sally to say sorry, or maybe I want Sally to replace it, but you can already see that it, the de-escalation is happening, but never by making Johnny feel like his feelings aren't valid because you have to self-validate yourself all the time. Self-validation is really critical here. And the highest level of honesty is required at this stage. And that's why I encourage you to not shy away from being exactly honest when you first start out this process and saying, I want to break that person's toy, face, car, house, whatever. You're never going to get to uh, be the, be the you know, ringmaster of your arena of success until you're perfectly honest with yourself. And anybody that you choose to allow uh, to assist you. Okay, so as um, we talked about uh, the second question, how will I know when I've got it? And um, my mistake when I said this was one of four, this is one and two of four points. Um, so one is what do I want? And number two is how, when I, how will I know when I've got it? And the most critical aspect of this, which I hope you, you kind of grasped when I demonstrated how Johnny would have to visualize what the world would look like once he broke Sally's toy in retaliation type of thing. And that's the critical piece here. Now, initially, when you're learning this focus framework, that's going to be critical for helping you understand uh, which of your core emotions are driving you in these decision making moments. But as you move uh, forward through it, it's going to be the thing that dictates your success. Like you, you, this is, this is what we call manifestation. Now, when you visualize the solution, it's the thing you want to manifest. And, and so therefore you will move forward. And that's part of that refining aspect of this, uh, system that I'm, that I'm sharing with you is that when you visualize a situation, when you've been honest and you've said, I want to break so-and-so's thing in retaliation, and then you visualize the situation going down where you break that person's thing and there's more problems and more confrontation. And, you know, that's, that's, that doesn't, that's not going to go through the gears. It's, it's, it's not going to work. It is not going to bring the solution you want. And eventually at some point through this process, you're going to go, yeah, that's not, that's not going to get me what I want. That's why as you get better and better at this, you will manifest what you want because you will have trained yourself to redirect yourself as soon as the, the visualized outcome isn't what you want. Now, most of us don't take the time to visualize the outcome in a way that affects us. Like we visualize it in a way that where we win or all of those things, but we don't uh, do the 360 degree assessment of how it will affect everybody. Oh, we've reached that part of the night where I wish we where you know, I wish I never had to stop talking because I'm fired up. Whoa, another F word. Fire. Now, this over here, this green section is all the notes on uh, how will I know when I've got it? So just like I was giving you the other points on, you know, asking yourself, what do I want? There are a lot of criteria and a lot of checkpoints when you ask yourself the question, how will I know when I've got it? But the most important thing here is that you use every sense you have to describe your reality when you visualize having the thing that you said you wanted. I'm going to say that again. The most important aspect of asking yourself, how will I know when I've got it, when I've got what I want, is the visualization of every one of your senses. So when you think about, think about something good, right? Like think about a dream job or a dream mate or like a meal. I mean, I dream about food all the time, but just think about something you really, really, really want and how, what will life look like when you've got it? But, you know, how will you look when you walk into the place that you dream of going and what will your voice sound like? And what will the air smell like? What will you see? Where will you, what will you be wearing? What, what, what will you, what did you drive there? Like, do you understand how deep I'm getting here? That visualization you will naturally resist from going that deep on a visualization that doesn't serve you. You, will you don't want to manifest those 
gross things, those bad feelings. And that's what you're, that's what you're teaching yourself within your arena of success. So that is the green section here. Number one, what do I want? Number two, how do I know what I've got it? What will my life look like? Now there's another, uh, there's a whole pile of other things there that I'll just briefly mention. Uh, you also, when you ask yourself, how will I know when I've got what I want, you need to be uh, able and willing to take responsibility for any outcome. Now, I, when I learned the importance of how, uh, what do I want and how will I know when I've got it, I learned the art of being relentless. I literally have branded myself. This is a tattoo on my arm. My, my business is called Relentless and Company. My license plate is personalized. I mean, it, the reason for this is because I will not stop pursuing because I have so much trust. I mean, once I have done the process, I will manifest and I will not stop. Um, and, and, and that doesn't mean uh, it's not derogatory or negative in any way. It's really quite wholesome because, because I was able to, through, through the cognitive rehabilitation, build myself an arena of success and a focus framework in it. I can constantly jump back into it and just not quit until I, I've gotten exactly what it was that I wanted. You have to explore your scenarios and gain lots of insight. It seems pretty simple enough, uh, but oftentimes you'd be shocked at how little we know about the things that are going on around us and we make a lot of assumptions. Um, and so if I coach somebody through these processes, I often find this is a big spot where people have overlooked, um, again, just understanding how we impact the world around us. Um, you also have to know what your boundaries are. And I'm surprised when I started coaching this, I was really surprised to see how many people um, didn't even have boundaries, let alone know what they were. So, um, you know, as a side note, definitely, definitely uh, be ready to learn how to set boundaries and stand by them when you want to put yourself into the arena of success, because the ability to have and own your boundaries is definitely a huge part of this recipe. Now, uh, step three, I have crafted with a bit of an, I think it's called an anagram, like where uh, the, the initials make a phrase or something like that. However, um, the letters are C, Y, A, and we're all adults here. So I think we can just feel comfortable understanding that it kind of sort of means cover your arse See what I did there? Uh, but just to stay safe, I did call this particular section, create your actions. And I love that. It's very powerful because when you look at your own life as something that you created, when you think about the way you act and behave and you think about, oh, those are the actions that I created. That's the plan I made. That's the, that's the path that I laid and I just walked it. That's a powerful place to be. And it feels really good. So I always encourage you that once you, you know, if you're spending this time and you're working on creating your arena of success and you're working on your focus framework, you're asking yourself, what do I want? And you're going through that refining process of visualizing and being certain, you know, once you've done that, you earned the right to create your actions because you are working thoughtfully, purposely, purposefully. I'm not sure which one of those words is the more appropriate one, but it's a beautiful thing. Like, congratulations if you've getting, gotten to this stage because you're not responding anymore. You see, what's happening is we've, we, we are learning, to, you know, through this process, learning to become proactive, even in the heat of the moment, which almost sounds impossible, but it's not when you realize that almost everybody around you is reactive in nature. So at this point, when you have already... Um, and check when you've asked yourself what do I want how will I know when I've got it that's when you get to create your actions because you've already decided what it is you want you've visualized what you know what your life will look like when you've got it guess what you're again you're not focused on whatever triggered you all of this started because something triggered you and now we're manifesting a beautiful life and we're only on step three but you get to create your actions and this is so
Hey, Melanie. We lost, lost you again. Sound. There we go. Can you just repeat the last bit here? We're facts. Sorry, Melanie. I, got, I was wrong. Hey, Melanie. And so that's the biggest piece of section three is bef when you're creating your actions, you separate the facts from the feelings so that you know which ones are things that you need to sit with and which ones are things you need to build with. I'm gonna say that again. In step three, when you create your actions, you separate your facts from your feelings, F words. But you do that so that you know which things you need to sit with and which things you need to build with. That's why you're gonna feel powerful. You don't get rid of any of it because you're valid and beautiful and wonderful just the way you are. The last thing that you're gonna do in this section, and again, many, many notes and points, but we only have a little bit of time. But the last thing you do is communicate. And remember, remember that the whole thing that started this was a trigger, a trigger that gave us feels that we didn't like. And all of a sudden, you know, we got to say, okay, what do I want? And how will I know when I've got it? And what are the facts? And what are the feelings? And now it's time to communicate. So you think about the, this all happens, like I literally have broken down what happens for the person that does not have an injured frontal lobe, somebody that does not, you know, does not have a, a, a neurodivergence. This happens for them instantly. And I broke that down into a series of steps that can be learned and harnessed and owned. So step four is when you communicate. And even that has criteria. And I have three more F words. And in step four, that's when we communicate, but only when our communications, whenever it is, whatever it is we're about to do is fair, firm, and friendly. And, and I have criteria for those too, which you'll be able to read in those notes. But when you communicate in ways that are fair, firm, and friendly, you are again will be in your arena of success 100 percent of the time it doesn't mean that you won't have um conflict and it doesn't mean that you won't have situations that don't feel good it does not mean that you won't be triggered it just means that you get to remain in control of how and when you feel what you feel and what your life will look like that should be yours to control. It should be. And that's why I developed a curriculum of the focus framework. And that's why I broke down into microscopic steps, the thinking process of a person that does not have a, an injury or an illness or any, um, you know, thing that causes their brain to work differently. And not, not that you have to, I mean, this works for everybody, right? But this is the reason why I had to develop this was because without understanding this, I would not be successful at anything that I have attempted. And I have successfully beat every single odd that they put in front of me. So with that, it is right about time for me to, um, wrap up and open the, the floor for dialogue and conversation uh, questions. And I would invite Lex to um, stop recording this point so that everybody has a comfort level. And I want to just also th say thank you so much for your attention and time for this last 45 minutes. And I hope the next 15 will be the most uh, meaningful discussion we can have. Thanks so much, Melanie.